Good morning, everyone. We are in Merging with Shiva Lessons, Clear White Light. Given in 1967, Lago Majori. Little background, last we left Gurudeva with the Actinix World Tour in Europe, and now we're bringing him home here, returning to America from Europe. Returning to America from Europe. Guru David dove into the spiritual regimens he loved so. Sunday sermons, monks training, radio interviews, the long desert drives to the Nevada monastery. He had gained some fame as a yoga teacher and, to his surprise, was invited to be a guest professor at UCLA for a week, lecturing from the master course. He held a similar series at the International House in Berkeley for UC students, lectured at Stanford, and traveled on an extensive speaking tour through Southern California, Colorado, the East Coast, British Columbia, and Washington. In Seattle, he gave talks on human mysticism and esoterics at the Aquarian Foundation, a spiritualist occult church established in 1955 by Reverend Keith Reinhardt, whom Gurudeva knew well. It was a time of reaching out, taking the deepest teachings into the colleges and communities around America. It was not a time to remain silent about the self, he would say but they shouted out from the rooftops. American youth were remarkably open to this mystical message during those few years as never before or since. Then back to the lesson, 55, turning to the inner light. Thousands of young aspirants who have had bursts of inner light have evolved quickly. Assuredly, this has been their natural evolutionary flow. This oversensitization of their entire mind structure so suddenly intensified into transcendental realms caused the materialistic states to decentralize attachments to their present life patterns, school interests, and plans for the future. A springboard is needed. A new balance must be attained in relating to the materialistic world. For the physical body still must be carried on for to unfold further into the human destiny of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the realization of the self beyond the states of mind. Enlightened seers are turning inward to unravel solutions and building new models to bring forth new knowledge from inner realms to creatively meet man's basic needs and to bring through to the external spheres beauty and culture found only on inner planes, thus heralding the golden age of tomorrow and the illumined beings of the future who, through the use of their disciplined third eye and other faculties, can remain within the clear white light while working accurately and enthusiastically in the obvious dream world. Should he come out too far into materialism and consciousness, the inner voice may be falsely identified as an unseen master or a god talking into his right ear. But when in the clarity of white light, he knows that it is his very self. Realizing he is the force that propels him onward, the aspirant will welcome discipline as an intricate part of his internal government so necessary to being clear white light. It is a great new world of the mind that is entered into when first the clear white light dawns, birthing a new actinic race, immediately causing him to become the parent to his parents and forefathers. But living in an expanded inner state of mind, he must not expect those living in materialistic consciousness to understand him. On this new path of the Lonely One, wisdom must be invoked to cause him to be able to look through the eyes of those who believe the world is real 
and see and relate to that limited world in playing the game as if it were real. Thus maintaining the harmony so necessary for future unfoldments. To try to convince those embedded in materialism of the inner realities only causes a breach in relationship as it represents a positive threat to the security they have worked so hard to attain. First, we had the instinctive age of valuing physical strength and manly prowess, followed by the intellectual age, facts for the sake of facts, resulting in the progress of science. Now we are in a new age of new values, new governing laws, an actinic age with new understanding of the world, the mind, but most of all, the self. Understanding is preparation for travel, for it is an age of the mind, and in the mind, much more intense than the speed of light, exist spheres which seers are only willing to speak of to those who have the inner ear with which to listen. The mind of man tends either toward light or toward darkness, expanded awareness or materialistic values. Depending upon the self-created condition of the mind, man lives either within the clear white light of the higher consciousness or in the external mind structure which reflects darkness to his inner vision. I say my comment to the end here. Comment. Gurudeva has described two differing approaches to life. One is the materialistic approach, and the second is the spiritual approach to life. Those holding the materialistic approach do not understand those holding the spiritual approach. We have a wonderful term in our lexicon, adhyatma vikasha, spiritual unfoldment. The blossoming of inner or higher soul qualities as a result of religious striving, sadhana. Vikasha means becoming visible, shining forth, manifestation, opening as a flower unfolds its petals or the chakras unfold theirs as a result of kundalini awakening. So that's spiritual unfoldment, adhyatma vikasha. Back to the text. The uninitiated might ask, what is it like to be in the clear white light? The young aspirant may reply, it is as unique as sitting in a darkened room, closing the eyes in deep concentration and finding the entire inside of the cranium turning into light. At first it may be only a dim moonlight glow, a pale flicker of several different colors, but then it becomes as bright and intense as the radiance of the noonday sun. Then crystal clear and white, it all depends upon the composition of the mind states of reactionary patterns as to how the light in the cranium will first appear. Of course, clear white light is not absolute, for light invariably implies the existence of shadow. The shadows that sometimes fade out inner light are the instinctive functions that hold the physical body intact. These are represented as attributes in the external mind and character of man. Attachment, for instance, holds ourselves together. It is also the root of much suffering, for attachment to material objects or people keeps man's awareness externalized, incapable of expressing itself in full freedom. The Yoga Sutras has some interesting Verses on attachment gives an insight you may not have thought about. Starts out with the normal concept. Verse 117. Attraction is that which rests on pleasant experiences. Makes sense. My comment. 
Of course, an individual is attracted to a multitude of objects and individuals not previously experienced. What this verse is saying is that one's strongest attractions are based on memories of having experienced pleasure. So that's what creates our strongest attraction. And this is the one you may not have thought of. Next verse. Aversion is that which rests on sorrowful experiences. When the concept of being detached is initially thought about, it would be common to focus solely on lessening our attachment to what we consider pleasurable. However, strong attachments also exist to our memories of what caused us suffering, such as mistreatment from our parents. It is necessary to also detach from these memories of suffering. Oh, there's two types of attachment, positive and negative. Back to Gurudev's text. Man who is caught in the magnetic forces is prone to resentment. Not being able to cognize various fears as they occur, he stores them up into a conscious resentment of all threats to the false securities found in attachment. Resentment burrows deeply into the outer mind's layers, undermining much of a person's creative endeavor. The reactionary conditions resentment is capable of agitating our subconscious and cast many shadows over clarity of perception for long periods of time. Those who resent are often jealous, another shadow or character weakness which stems from feelings of inferiority, a limited view of one's real self. After one burst of clear white light has occurred, the force fields of attachment, resentment, and jealousy are shattered. An increased control of the mind and expanded consciousness is maintained, which frees man little by little from ever again, generating the magnetic holes consuming his consciousness in these shadows. When man allows himself to retain his external thinking and action to settle into uncreative static conditions, pressures of various sorts build up and the undisciplined mind releases itself to the emotion of anger, a state of consciousness which renders a man blind to the existence of inner light in any degree. So Gurudeva has made the important point here that what leads to anger is allowing the mind to function in an undisciplined way. Something we may not have thought of. And the text. Fear is another shadow which causes man to have an inability to face a critical moment, even in the intimacy of his deepest meditation. But fear is a protective process of the instinctive mind, allowing time to temporarily avoid what must later be faced. Fear being an intense force in the minds as well as the body structure must be handled positively. For when man thinks under the shadow of fear, he causes his fears to manifest. That's an important point. If you think about something intensely enough, will create it. <laughs> well, that's not good in the case of what we're fearing. The flickering shadows of worry brought on by allowing the mind to irrationally jump from one subject to another, never centralizing on any one point long enough to complete it, must be handled through disciplining the flow of thought force. For worry produces a darker shadow, fear. That's a beautiful definition of worry there. Allowing the mind to irrationally jump from one subject to another, never centralizing on any one point long enough to complete it. Worry. So clearly we need to complete it. <laughs> it's 
stick to the point and figure it out. Fear when disturbed causes anger, submerged anger, resentment, causing a jealous nature, hence the constant play of the clear white light versus the shadows. And the last sentence is a beautiful one. By becoming conscious of the way in which the mind operates, in even a small degree, the young aspirant to light finds it easy to fold back the shadows into shafts of clear white light. My comment on that. In other words, we need to see the pattern of events that causes us to experience anger, jealousy, etc. And then through exercising self-control, create alternative ways of reacting that avoid these instinctive emotions. So we're seeing how the mind operates. It's a pattern. We all have patterns, have a patterns as to how we're reacting and we can change them. Second point is, if we end up in a negative emotion, to use one of the tools for merging with Shiva to quickly move out of the emotion, such as by flooding the aura with a color, extra worship of Lord Ganesha, or affirmations. So Dear Dave has given us lots of tools, and as he loved to say, you just have to use them. When you end up in a negative emotion, use them to move out of it as quickly as possible. Have a wonderful day.